So when we get into memory, I did want to talk about the differences because there are seven really key skill areas that affect learning specifically. And why we look at learning specifically is because that's when we're processing for new information or even sometimes known information. And so we look at attention skills, we look at working memory, and we look at processing speed, which all three make up our executive functioning skills. Those are the processing skills behind our executive functioning abilities. And so When we work with a client with ADHD, for example, we're looking at those three skill areas and what we have found through studies of more than 5,000 children and adolescents with ADHD, that broad attention is not actually the weakest skill area. Working memory and processing speed are both weaker areas for those with ADHD. So what that means is I think about working memory as sort of the mental post-it, you know, we need to do something really quickly, but then we can move on from that. Or how many tabs you can keep open in your brain window. And so when you are able to keep a lot of tabs open and then task switch, so go back and forth really efficiently, then you don't have those symptoms, right, of ADHD. But when you struggle with going between tabs, what was I just working on? Oh, I have to start over. Oh, I missed that one. That is the skill, working memory, that affects our executive functioning that is a symptom of ADHD along with a lot of other symptoms. And so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense when you get down into that nitty gritty of working memory. What is that like? Then you can start, once you've identified that, you can start working to actually build skill in that area through exercise. Welcome to the Shift Your Vibe to Thrive podcast. My name is Emily Evans Russell, and I'm a single mom, multiple six figure business owner, and master mindset and energy coach. I created this podcast with two main targets one, to give you practical tools so that no matter where you are in your life right now, you not only know that things can shift, but you know how to make them greater. And two, to change your frequency so that you become an energetic match for everything you desire. I'm talking your relationships, your finances, your success, all of it. Think of this podcast as your weekly energetic upgrade with a mix of subconscious mind hacks, ways to quantum leap, and consciousness shifts. A place where you learn to sculpt your reality and actually finally truly have the magical life you deserve and one that works for uniquely you. Are you ready to uplevel your reality? I think I hear yes, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for being here. And now let's go to the show. Okay. So Michelle, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really honored to have a master brain trainer with me. (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm really excited to talk about it. So thanks for having me. Yeah. So where should we start? Do you want to talk about what is brain training and what is neuroplasticity and how how can we use that to our advantage? What is this? Well, Here's what I love. So I love that you know the word neuroplasticity. And this is kind of a fun litmus test for me because when I started this work 14 years ago in 2010, people did not know that word. So I was all the time, you know, we're just understanding this scientific research behind under knowing that the brain can change. There has always been kind of an idea of maybe it can, maybe it can't under what conditions, but that's essentially what neuroplasticity is. And what it means is that the brain is capable of change. It is not the same brain that you were born with that you always have. And what's interesting is how that relates to IQ. And that is something that has been always been thought of your brain is just your brain. I'm a math brain, or I'm not a math brain, or I have these kinds of smarts or not these kinds of smarts. And so So my specialty area is talking about and looking at cognitive skills specifically. So not, I mean, certainly the brain is so complex. There's so much you can talk to in regards to the brain and talk about. But what I like to talk about specifically when we're looking at neuroplasticity is how we can change brain skills, cognitive skills to our benefit, like you said, because um, when you learn and know that you can develop attention and you can develop memory, and you can develop processing skills, and those are related to whatever your certain area is or whatever your need is, 
then the implications there are huge. And so this research and this science has changed so much over the last even 14 years since I started to where in the past, even five years, the organization I work with has had 10 new published studies with the APA and neuroscience and applied cognitive psychology and all these really cool places where we're looking at, okay, we can change the brain, but let's like really get down to the nitty gritty of how we do that and show that on fMRI imaging and through randomized control trials. And so it's just really cool new stuff. Oh my gosh. So I want to ask you some of that nitty gritty that the audience, people listening can understand. And I'm going to ask you, so I'm a mom. I have two daughters and who have, I would say very different brains, the way their brains function. And I'm really fascinated by what you said, because I think most of us can relate to depending on how school was for you. You know, we often get pegged as, well, you're really good at science and math, or you're good at this. And I have one daughter that really has a hard time memorizing and which at her age, you know, becomes a problem with multiplication tables and math. So then she thinks she's not good at that where my other daughter memorizes really easily. So she thinks she's good at school and the other one has decided she's not good at school. Yeah. So can you talk about a little bit about, (laughs) about that? Yes. And isn't that so interesting because we all have different areas of strengths and weaknesses and we know that consciously, right? We're aware of that, but then it starts to develop this kind of fixed mindset of, oh, well, I just can't do that. So I'll avoid that, but I'm great at this. So I'll do more of this. And actually over time, what happens is that our strengths get stronger and our weak areas get weaker. And so essentially what we do is we identify, and I say we, and the organization I work with is Learning RX because um, it's the largest brain training company in the world. But we look at a specific assessment that a lot of cognitive psychologists will do to say, where are your individual strengths or weaknesses? And then how do we start developing those weak areas? So instead of being a strength focused idea, it's looking at if we know that memory, for example, and there's different kinds of memory, let's get into that too. But if we can develop that memory and make it work more efficiently, that's what essentially will change that part of the brain. And when you think about the implications of this brain that I have, and you know, for one, accepting that and being okay with that, that's part of it. But then knowing that it can be exercised and changed as part of that growth mindset that you get to, it kind of goes hand in hand. So we can just change things by changing the way that we look at them. And that's essentially what this skills training looks at doing. So when we get into memory, I did want to talk about the differences because there are yeah. seven really key skill areas that affect learning specifically. And why we look at learning specifically is because that's when we're processing for new information or even sometimes known information. And so we look at attention skills, we look at working memory, and we look at processing speed, which all three make up our executive functioning skills. Those are the processing skills behind our executive functioning abilities. And so When we work with a client with ADHD, for example, we're looking at those three skill areas and what we have found through studies of more than 5,000 children and adolescents with ADHD that broad attention is not actually the weakest skill area. Working memory and processing speed are both weaker areas for those with ADHD. So what that means is I think about working memory as sort of the mental post-it, you know, we need to do something really quickly, but then we can move on from that or how many tabs you can keep open in your brain window. And so when you are able to keep a lot of tabs open and then task switch, so go back and forth really efficiently, then you don't have those symptoms, right? Of ADHD. But when you struggle with going between tabs, what was I just working on? Oh, I have to start over. Oh, I missed that one. That is the skill working memory that affects our executive functioning. That is a symptom of ADHD along with a lot of other symptoms. And so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense when you get down into that nitty gritty of working memory. What is that like? Then you can start, once you've identified that, you can start working to actually build skill in that area through exercise. 
Wow. So is that, I love that analogy of how many tabs can you have open and flip between them efficiently. So I grew up in an era where I wouldn't have been diagnosed with ADHD, but I've realized the way I work. I mean, my physical computer is an example. I usually have about 30 tabs open, but my brain seems to work the same way. And I used to really find it a deficiency, but now I actually find it a capacity where I can have a lot of projects going on and then pull one that kind of rises to my attention to work on. So is that something that maybe I've developed or is that so that's something, okay, you can switch, so you can train that ability. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, that is part of it. But when you think about, again, being efficient with that, that's really what I look at. So you might go back to that same tab five times. You still are able to go back to that tab. So you might think, look, I went back to that tab, but maybe you had to go back five times before you could complete that. That's not necessarily an inefficient use of working, or or that would be an inefficient use of working memory as opposed to an efficient one. Yeah. Wow. And so my younger daughter, we did do some brain testing for her and they got to the processing speed. I think you're speaking of, and Mm -hmm. the woman asking, well, what do you think her processing speed is going to be? If we think of it like a computer, like really fast or really slow. And, and I said, you know, I think it's going to be really fast, even though teachers would might notice her as spacing off or not paying attention. And the woman said, yeah, she's like 99th percentile processing speed, but that has been hard for her because her brain's processing quickly and new information hasn't been as easy to grab at the beginning. And you know what? She's probably really tired and really exhausted with all of, because she can process so much so quickly that it's almost too much. And I see that actually is another common symptom with ADHD is really fast processing speed because you may not be able to get anything done, but you have about 20 projects you're working on, you know, at the same time. So, so how it do we, like whether they're kids or adults, you know, parents listening or for themselves, how can we start utilizing that we have so much, no matter what we're doing for our jobs, there's so much information coming in all the time yeah, and so, true. School, so noisy and loud. How are there yeah. any other things we can do without, if we go to, now I'd love you to talk about brain training sessions, but even in like our daily yeah. life, are there things we can start doing? Well, here's what I think about practically, because I get this question a lot, and especially with aging actually is where this comes in the most, like my mom is aging or um, my grandmother, and I'm starting to notice she's not recalling things. She's not, you know, but she does her crossword puzzles every day. And usually I'll say if she loves crossword puzzles, then she probably does not, it's not a weak area for her and it's not brain training. So brain training is when anytime you do something different or challenging, so you can tell what that might be for you. So someone who loves crossword puzzles and hates Sudoku, for example, I would say I would do Sudoku every single day and challenge the thing that's hard. And when you think about brain training, it's just the, the same way you would think about a personal trainer or a gym workout. So can we find that weak area and then can we challenge that weak area? So for someone who struggles with visual processing, for example, they're going to have a lot of difficulty with following a map, not be able to get anywhere without a GPS. And I would say, okay, use the GPS your first time. That's fine. But when you go back to a place you've already been, I want you while you're following the GPS the first time to really think about your surroundings and look at where you are track your mileage, really pay attention. And you're going to be using that visual processing skill, which that brings in a whole other topic of how technology keeps us from using our own brains to, you know, follow directions, to remember things. We make lists in there. And so for visual processing, that's an example. If you know, that's a weak area, you can practice and exercise that by literally following maps, doing jigsaw puzzles that you probably hate. (laughs) and avoid. I mean, and some people just don't like that when they puzzles, when they struggle with visual processing, when it comes to something like memory, I really get that question a lot too, because how do we challenge our memory? When we're in school, we are forced to memorize a lot. So when we struggle with long-term memory and long-term memory does not mean, can we remember something for a long time? When we're measuring that, we're looking at, can we efficiently store a piece of information and retrieve it 
later, even if it's five minutes later. So did we store it and then are we able to retrieve it or do we have to repeat it? So you might repeat it 10 times and then you have it. That would be an inefficient long-term memory, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. when we think about strengthening that skill and using that skill and we're using it a lot in school. Well, after school, we don't really memorize a whole lot. Our grocery list, and we'll write that down and we'll forget some things. So we use actually a visual memory technique that a lot of memory masters also use, and this has been written about many times. It is how you can create a visual association to tie to something. And so I can't remember the name of the author, the memory master who uses this technique of the memory palace. A lot of people have heard about that. And it's essentially a home a house palace where he creates and he will put things in rooms and he will picture them in those rooms. Then he can walk through the house in his mind and go through and find all the things in the rooms. And you can do that to remember hundreds of items. It's amazing. So when you do that, use that technique to remember your grocery list. If I need some bananas, then I'm going to picture some bananas. And I want to picture in my mind, I go to a bunch of bananas and they're yellow and green. So you have to visualize your own, what you can remember, what pops into your head immediately, a bunch of bananas. Maybe the next thing is peanut butter. So I'm actually going to picture to connect these items that banana peel falling off and dripping peanut butter. And I'm literally making this up as I go with what I picture in my mind. So then the next thing I need is blueberries. Now that peanut butter drips onto the blueberries. And now I see a pile of blueberries on the floor and they're actually in the container. And then the next item I need is bread. So the blueberries fall over and start sticking into this piece of bread. I'm going to picture... I love sourdough. I'm going to picture a sourdough loaf of bread and these <laughs> blueberries in there. So now I have this great visual I've come up with really quickly and I can say, okay, I need bananas. Or do you want to tell me my list? Did you picture it? Yeah. Bananas, peanut butter, blueberries, and bread. Yeah. yeah. And so when you can do that with 15 items and remember all of them when you have a great visual. So when you practice that, you get good and efficient at that. That's essentially all we do at Learning Our is we're personal trainers that make you practice the right things in the right way, in an efficient way. But you can do these things. You know, we're brain training all the time. It's just, it's hard to think about, okay, if I brush my teeth with my right hand every day then when I brush it with my left hand, I'm training my brain. I'm doing something different. And that's actually what creates a new neural connection using neuroplasticity to change the brain. It's very cool stuff. Wow. So it's really doing anything new and different. That's going to be- yeah. Learn a language, the- learn an instrument. Yeah. So how do you get over? I know I see this with my daughters, but I think it's pretty natural where we want to avoid something at first, that's going to be harder. Like, I don't want to start something new unless I'm just good at it right away. Yes. <laughs> that's not oh, how you is- get better. <laughs> so how do you, how do you um, encourage people to do the thing that is going to be hard at first? This is so good because this is the crux of growth mindset and why it's so important and how it affects us in our mindset for the rest of our lives. And Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, really details this research that she did out of Harvard, where she was looking at for the freshman class at Harvard. They're all really smart kids. They've gotten into Harvard. What is What can we identify or what would be different about those who are dropping out in their first semester versus staying enrolled at the university? And she was able to put them into one of those two mindsets. They are smart. They've always been able to do well. But the moment things got challenging, when we turn away from that, that would indicate that we have a fixed mindset. We avoid challenges. We don't want to do hard things. And it's very easy when we grow up in an environment of, you know, especially a school situation where mistakes are wrong. They're bad. You're not supposed to get that answer wrong. You get an X, you get a minus red pen, whatever it is, it's bad to make a mistake. And that really reinforces this idea of not making mistakes. And one of the beautiful things about training right off the bat that in our very first session with our clients that we work with is we're going to do hard things and we're going to love it. We're going to do it together and we're going to do it over and over again. It's going to be great. And it's almost like desensitizing this issue with mistakes and failure. And not only that, but for kids, especially when you target your praise to praise effort and strategies and processes and the hard things, 
and not the right answers. And we've gotten to the point with my girls where if they have an A on something, it's just kind of like, well, okay, did you think that, you know, that's fine. But when you really worked hard on something, that's what garners the praise. Or if you get an A, wow, you must have really put in some effort on that to get that A. It's about the effort that I care about. It's hard because we like to tell our kids they're so smart and wonderful. And when we associate smart with something like good grades, then when they don't have a good grade, guess what they say? And we've never said, you're not smart, but they say that. They say, I must not be smart because I don't have good grades. And that's what equals smart. And so it's really interesting when you dig into that mindset and growth mindset. And that I really highly recommend anything by Carol Dweck. She led up this research, but there is a great website. I love biglifejournal.com. And they send free printables to me every week that I print off and I love. And I use for growth mindset. There's praise tips. There's topic conversations, especially since I work with kids, I use that a lot. And that's a big area that goes into adulthood. Yeah. I ordered two journals from Big Life Journal. That's, I, didn't, the, I love it. The daughter's <laughs> like, we don't want to fill these out. These are silly. But, yeah. and, and as a parent, it's been so hard to, ca- hard to catch myself with that because I very much grew up in that, like, you're so smart. And then I would feel awful if I didn't do well. And it's just such a, again, a habit that yes. we're used to praising that way rather than the effort. That's such a big but it serves you for the rest of your life. The rest of your life. Yeah. And and truthfully, I was the same way. And just a little bit about my background, I was a really bright student. And it turns out, I know now that I just had really efficient cognitive skills. But honestly, Emily, I always felt like I was fooling everyone because I'm like, they all think I'm so smart, but this is just really easy for me. I'm not giving great effort. And so I was in a fixed mindset for a long time where if it, something was challenging, oh, I'm just not good at that. I need to stick with the things that I'm good at. And it has been a total life changer. This whole journey of me discovering cognitive skills and finding that how, what a huge role this plays. And then that you can change that. And it's really just kind of determined this path that I'm on and I'm learning all the time, especially about mindset. Yeah. I remember reading Carol's books when I got, I have my master's degree in teaching and going back to learn all that so that when I was teaching you could learn how to like praise the effort and the work. And can you talk about another phrase that I certainly didn't hear growing up and you probably in your work is neurodiverse? Yes. Can you talk about what that means and what it is? Yes. And you're right. This has never been talked about before. And I love it. I love that it is because you know, it gives us the idea that everyone, the affirmation maybe that everyone is not the same. Everyone's brain is not the same. And you say that and it's kind of like, well, yeah, of course, everyone's brain is not the exact same. But what happens is that when you start making it kind of normal to understand that and know that, then it changes this systematized idea of you need to be able to do these things and check these boxes. And I think actually this makes me think about the bigger conversation about our educational system, because it's not going to be able to keep up the way that it has been. And there are five new micro schools just in our area that have opened up this year and continuing to the, this movement with homeschooling and all these things because of the challenges with really checking these boxes and being this certain way. But neurodiversity really just has to do with having, whether it's a sensory difference, a cognitive difference, it's not so much a physical difference. It really is more so in processing, but so many kids and adults that are on the spectrum, the autism spectrum that have ADHD or a sensory processing challenge, those kinds of things that are just not neurotypical. And it's fun for me because I do so much testing. And of course I'm testing people who are, maybe have some kind of a struggle, but I've just never seen two brains test the same. And I've tested twins and all kinds of really fun stuff, but I like to think that everyone doesn't have the same brain. And so it's hard for me to even think anyone is neurotypical because 
there are so many variances, but there are different levels and neurodiverse really is referring to those who have a specific diagnosis or tendency that is not the neurotypical way to process or do things. Yeah. So how do you see, I love that you mentioned our education system. So now that we recognize no brain is the same and neurotypical might be what people are used to thinking is normal or what has performed well in our typical society. How do you see education changing or requiring to change as we start noticing where some kids that are labeled neurodiverse or on the spectrum just aren't succeeding in a typical school setting? What are some of the cool things that you've seen developing like in the micro schools and what do you what would you love to see as a future (laughs) oh gosh oh gosh (laughs) you know it's what I'm seeing in that's happening in the public school system is there's just an increase in testing and individual education plans IEPs and those it's really challenging because it ends up being a lot of work and bureaucratic government paperwork for the a nice goal to follow these individual plans but really smaller classrooms have to happen more teacher training has to happen in the micro schools that i'm seeing opening that are doing really well one of them has a focus on individual learners and they're kind of all together in age groups. And actually that's been an interesting thing in a couple of different micro schools I can think about where they're very self or they're very child led. And so one school uses the Acton method, which may be something I can share some links to, to share some information about that, but it's this idea of every child as an inner hero. So you have these kids who have struggled in a traditional school system and they're totally no confidence and they're in a fixed mindset and they just think that they're the worst because they are not able to keep up or perform or do what they need to do. And they find their inner hero and they get leadership about that through this kind of method of schooling. It's really more like unschooling, but it is so cool because it's got this further idea of development into adulthood went into a person and not just checking the boxes of academics, of reading, writing, and math. And so I think that's what we have to get away from is more kind of whole child development and interests and not just, are you going to be this kind of worker or this kind of worker? Yeah. And I love that because it focuses on rather than in typical schooling, like when I grew up and when I taught, your identity was sort of based on the track you were in at school. I remember when I taught in Chicago public schools, we had advanced placement AP, then there was double honors, then there was single honors, then there was regular, and then there was a low regular. And I was like, look at what that does to the identity of the kid. Yeah. It's like, I'm in low regular classes. And and you probably know this study, I'd love you to talk about it, where they took a class that typically would have been the low regular class but told them that they were all in this advanced class and their grades all dynamically changed throughout the, just from not associating with that identity. Yeah, that is so interesting. And you think about even, you know, a lot of the kids that we work with that are, have an IEP or they have like special interventions or special pullouts. Well, you know, I don't know how, how, aware people are of this, but uh, nationwide, our third graders test at 35% proficiency in reading. And it has been that way for years and years and years. And there has been no change in changing different methodologies. And it's interesting because in August, I'll get the new published report from the last school year and I'll see it and read it. And then I can't find it again online. (laughs) I swear it's like, it's like, Hey, here it is. See you later. But it's very low proficiency. And so everyone's getting interventions. Everyone's getting as much as they can. I do not fault the school. I certainly do not fault the teachers. They are just between a rock and a hard place, but the focus is in the wrong place. And all the, the focus is coming from political standpoint, you know, it's really from Washington to Nashville to Chattanooga where I am. And it's like, locally, we need better reading scores. We need more reading, 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 reading take away the arts, take away the music, it's reading and the reading scores are not changing. And so it's a big problem. (laughs) Yeah. And I'd like to see something change because it is that 
to see, to keep doing the same thing and not see yes. results yes. is crazy. This is a definition of crazy. Totally insane. And one of the things that makes me so passionate about the work that we do is when we look at the brain and cognitive skills, and this was something that I saw as soon as during 2020, when the pandemic was happening and here I'm working with kids and masking becomes a requirement. And I know that when you can't see my mouth, and when you, my mouth is covered, you can't distinguish my sounds easily. And that auditory processing is the way the brain processes sounds is what we need to be able to do to blend words together. And so knowing that it was really tough to figure out how are we going to train auditory processing without a mask? We cannot. And so I consulted with audiologists and different doctors from different fields and areas and like, how can we do this? And since then we've tested, I've seen lower auditory processing scores than I have ever seen since that time. And so I just know the impact that that has had. Everyone knows, oh, well, COVID had this impact on education. Well, specifically on auditory processing and development. That's one. Of course, there's so many others to mention, but that has affected reading. And until you develop the cognitive processing skill of auditory processing, then you can start building on your reading skills. And that's where I think that there is a pyramid that I visualize that at the base of it is our physical well-being. This is our vision, our hearing, our sleep, our diet, our exercise, our physical bodies. And that is the base of our pyramid, of our well-being. Above that level, we have our social emotional. So when there's trauma, when there's other kinds of situations at home, when there's other things that kids might be going through, or even us as adults, of course. So there's the physical, the social, emotional, then there's the cognitive layer of processing. That's where we have our abilities to process or remember or stay focused or auditory or visual processing I mentioned, or problem solve. Mm -hmm. Then you have your academics at the very top, your reading, your writing, your math, your performance. And so when we just are constantly hitting that academics and we're not going down the layers, that's where we're missing the mark. And it's hard because schools cannot do everything, but really needs a strong community. And that's why I think these micro schools are going to do so well because they're focusing on that community. My daughter's in a forest school. That's amazing. She's outdoor all day long. And the language they use They have their mindful arrival time and they just thank, you know, each other. And they're so, they're full of gratitude and they're full of positive language about being in the forest and being with each other and how they treat each other and how they talk to each other. And the leadership of this particular forest school she pours into her teachers through retreats and through really fostering wellness in the person in the teacher herself or himself. And she builds this community. So all of us parents are so involved and I have met the most amazing people. We drive 45 minutes every day to to school. It's incredible. So anyway, that's what I would love to see in the future of education. And it needs something different. <laughs> Me too. That is such a beautiful story. I know I took my girls this past Christmas, we went to Baja, Mexico, and we were doing a walk through the desert. And the the guy taking us stopped and he was explaining how the cactuses do photosynthesis. And now I was a biology major. So I remember just memorizing the steps of this like desert plant photos. And as he's explaining it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is all those things I memorized. But in Like it makes so much more sense when you're standing out under this, the hot, hot sun and they're explaining, well, they don't open their cells in the middle of the day. They do it at night to take in the carbon dioxide. And my daughter is like, this makes so much more sense if I would have been out here learning this and not just memorizing, memorizing, memorizing and spitting it back for a test. And I could see my little ones, you know, I said before we went on this trip, because I'm an outdoor lover. And it seemed to have skipped a generation. So I said, before I, took them, I said, you can hate it. You can hate it, but we're just going to try this trip once. And then you can let me know how you think about it. And they both loved it. And you could see them just coming alive and understanding things that they had heard about in school, but were getting to experience with their bodies. And then like when we camped and they didn't have their phones and we didn't have a shower and they're like, actually, mom, I really like this. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> 
That's but it's amazing. New, like training their brain in a new yes. way. Yeah. Oh, it so is. Every time I, I thought about this too, uh, just another kind of little tip that I love is taking a different direction to get to somewhere that you maybe can figure out, you know, is another great way to just do something different instead of the same direction to go to the place you go to every day. That's so um, helpful. I'm going to use your GPS tip because I am one that gets so uh, like we moved to Chattanooga. We've been here like seven years now and I will still use my GPS <laughs> to get places. And I'm like, yeah. this is crazy. Cause I haven't taken the time to look around me and know the street names. Yeah. Like I normally would. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to yeah. take away that one. Yeah. Right good. Away. Well, and that's, that's the thing is like, step one is identify what's the thing I'm avoiding. And then maybe that's the thing I want to start trying when it comes to a, a cognitive processing skill. And then what are some different ways that I can try to use that skill? Because we're so good at making ourselves comfortable the older that we get. And so what happens is that we end up doing all those things that we're good at and avoiding those things that we're not great at. And our brain needs that challenge, that extra yeah. work. So do you have any last tips? So when we, we try the uncomfortable thing and we're doing that and we're making mistakes and not, not doing it quote well at first, are there any ways of looking at that or mindset shifts that you encourage people to approach those new things with, to avoid that kind of frustration of, oh, I don't, I'll just give up because I'm not good right away. I mean, so can you ask that one more time? I'm sorry. I'm zone. I'm thinking about forest school. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I want to go to that school. So like you said, as we get older, I mean, our natural tendency is to go towards what's comfortable. Yes. So as like, say I start a new thing, like I'm going to start learning Spanish and if I get frustrated at first because I'm, it's new and it's hard and maybe I've not been good at languages, how do you coach people at that beginning to deal with that initial, eh, I really don't want to keep going towards this because it is hard? Yeah, gosh, that is the hard part. And that's actually like anytime you start a new exercise routine or a new, anything that you know is going to be hard, how much will you avoid it before you actually do it? And I actually utilize methods from atomic habit where you're looking at habit stacking, for example, or even just starting it, doing the first five minutes and then not doing it again until you get more comfortable in that way. But there's always going to be a million excuses to not do something. So you really just have to decide that you want to do that and be determined and do that, whatever that thing may be. So I love that's that. probably what I would recommend is a time. Yeah, habit. that's, I mean, and I <laughs> just want to second that because I talk a lot about that with, I look at things a lot from the subconscious and I know the subconscious wants you to be comfortable and it wants you to be alive and safe. And when we avoid something, the subconscious goes, oh yeah, that is dangerous. And the more you avoid it, the more it, it solidifies that, yep, don't go there. And the subconscious is genuinely reading it as a threat. And by just doing what you said, if you do five minutes of something, and you purposely take an action, the subconscious goes, well, we don't normally run towards something that's dangerous. So if you're purposely doing this over and over again, even if it's five minutes, really quickly it shifts and you'll find yourself not avoiding that thing because you're basically training your brain to go, no, it's okay to go in this direction. It's not a big lion that wants to eat you. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just a new language or something that's yeah. hard at first. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Just yeah. a little something different. Even if it's like, I usually walk this way around this uh, island. I'm going to walk this way, you know, yeah. little things. But really, that's why we exist as an organization with what I do at Learning RX is because we kind of make people do, <laughs> we make people do the hard things. It's like when you have a personal trainer for your overseeing your gym workout, it's like that for your brain workout. And so it really can get in there and get some major changes. Oh, so where can people find you and then find Learning RX? Because you said it's one of the biggest organizations in the world. Yeah, yeah. It actually overseas and internationally, it's called Brain RX. Um, but in the States, it's called Learning RX. So learningrx.com is our website. Um, and that's RX as in prescription, but it's uh, for learning skills. And what's really cool about our website is there's a free survey on there that sometimes you can just kind of take and be like, oh, maybe this is a strength area or weak area. And I like knowing that just in, in that initial part, when you know that, then you can start enacting these little tips of what may, maybe am I avoiding that have to do with that weak area, you know, but I'm located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, 
and have been at the center here by Hamilton Place for about 14 years. And so we're here to stay for sure. And and do you guys, do you do only in-person sessions or can people do distant sessions as well? Yeah, no, we do virtual work. sessions. We actually have people training all over the country right now. We have students in Wisconsin and Virginia Beach and Alabama. Um, and we work with adults and children. I would say primarily children are when you know there's a struggle and it becomes apparent, but that struggle doesn't usually go away. And so many adults that we work with as well for that reason. So virtual in-person, and we also have options where we can train a home training, like a, sometimes a parent partner on some exercises to practice at home. And so that's a really good way to sort of have surround sound training and that gets pretty significant impacts and usually about a three to six month period for a lot of our training plans to increase. We're talking 15, 20 percentile points or three to five years improvement in that time frame. Wow. It's significant. Amazing. Well, thank you, Michelle, for being on here. This has been really fascinating. I, l- I could talk about this, about this with you all day. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, thank you for letting me talk about it. Cause same, I could talk about it all day. And I absolutely love that you're helping kind of think about, and I've been listening to your podcast since Molly shared it with me. I think yeah. we have our mutual friend, Molly and And I just love how you're getting into these little things, little changes you can make that can make huge impacts in your life and really taking control of that and taking charge of that. And I just was glad that you were up for talking about this because it's such a good fit for what you're doing. So it is. And it's such a good fit for these little changes. That's what I love is these little tweaks that can make really big impacts in your life, like you said, and that's where all the magic is. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I hope you got something out of that episode. If you like this podcast, please share it with someone you know who'd find it useful or interesting and subscribe so that you can listen to past and upcoming shows. 